It looks, it looks good. Uh, I, I'm not going to have to kick too many asses. It's, uh, uh, you seem to, most of you seem to be here, so welcome. Uh, the, the title of my session is Onboard Like a Juggernaut, and a juggernaut is this uh, uh, literal or metaphorical force regarded as mercilessly destructive and unstoppable. And that was like the mightiest uh, thing I could think of when I made up the title for my talk. And actually, when I was something years old, my dad sneaked me into this grown-up movie called Juggernaut, which is about a big ship who's about to explode. And it's like, I was completely amazed by this movie. I, I still remember it. It was because I've been seeing like Disney and shit before, and then I saw Juggernaut. And so I'm hoping to be able to give you that kind of experience here. And uh, um, maybe not life-changing, but uh, I'll do my best. So uh, my name is John Ekman. My claim to fame is this. I started Commercionista. We're an agency in Stockholm. We're 17 people. Uh, we're a, a conversion optimization consultancy agency. Yes, we are taking new clients. We have done over 400 projects, blah, 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 blah. So um, this is a guy that called me a couple of days ago. And he has this software as a service company. It's called Detectify. They will hack yourself or somebody else as well. So uh, are you familiar with this design? It's like they have this first this title, the subtitle here, down here and then a, a, a button, and he said, like, I want you to help me with this. I need to improve my conversions. And basically, this is what he said to me. Uh, we need a redesign by Monday. That'd be great. So, so they, they have now made the, the analysis that they need to change, uh, the, they need to redesign the website. So I'm, I'm starting to have this phone conversation with him about maybe they are not looking in the right direction. Maybe the, the, the front and center page uh, it's not the whole key to unlocking customer success for them. So uh, I tried to talk about this model that we use. Uh, I devised it my own. There are several models out there. There's one called Pirate Metrics, which you are maybe familiar with. Uh, I'm using this one because I think it relates better to how we work with customers. And basically, the life cycle looks like this. Somebody gets in on a as a quiet in acquisition. They become a visitor. And now you want it to register, and I call it a registered prospect, not the registered user, because they have not shown that they are actively using your product yet. So then they become an active user, uh, so they are using your product. And at the end of the day, you want them to become a paying customer. And finally, at the very, not end of the day, but end of the month and end of the year, you want them to become a staying customer. So that's uh, the final step. But then this shit happens. Oh, no, they churn. Oh, they, get, they leave you. So then you want them to become a returning customer. And then on top of this, or on, at the bottom of it, you have what's, what usually is referred to as the viral loop, which basically all these customers, mm, prospect states, they really refer others, which will bring you into your service. So this is the model that you need to be paying attention to. And what I'm going to try to do here, because I know, Pep, you're obsessing with like not doing any bullshit, but actually basing your talk on actual data that we see. So I'm going to try to look at these different steps and what you can do to get people to progress from one state to the other. And I will use some case studies that we've done in order to prove how that works. So the first step is try to get, trying to get to register. And here's a, a company we pitched recently. They are called My News Desk. If you know PR Web in the US, it's, it's a similar service. You can upload your, your, your news stories and things like that. So this is their homepage. Uh, this is a, just a screen capture of how it works. You, they, you come in, and you see you must always, there must always be a keyboard, and there should be like moving images in the background. And then there's some text here, and there's, you want them to click this. But you really want them to click here. But an, a way of getting people not to click there is by shining a projector light into their eye down here. So that, that would almost surely make them not click this button. So uh, now I trashed this site. But you know, when we were pitching them, we made an, a very short eye-tracking study with only three people, but just to show them a little bit of data of how people actually could be using their site. So uh, this is, um, this, these are some, some findings from the eye-tracking studio. The guy that does this, Patrick, for me, he likes this, these fancy openings, and I wasn't able to take it out of the video, so you had just have to suffer a few seconds. So you can see that people are now focusing on the, oh, yeah, they went down to the projector. You see that? So. Uh, and they're, they're looking at the text. Here's the second one. He looked at it a bit, and then he went up to the menu, and he deployed the menu. And so we're looking at what they're doing here. I'm just going to cut the video there. But basically, what we saw from this video, he's now trying to figure out what the hell they are doing. We had three users, and this was what we, we found. No one looked at the down arrow. I don't know if you noticed, but there was a small, down here, there was one of these little arrows that says, you can scroll here, come down at No one 
fixated their eye on that down arrow, which means that nobody saw it. Uh, nobody clicked the button in the middle, no one scrolled, and nobody understood jack shit of this page. So this is, could be, it's only three persons, but it could be a typical behavior on this page. But, and now you're saying, but John, this is like, are you not up to date with what's going on on the internet? Because the latest stuff is this. There is no fold. <laughs> shit. Uh, why the fold is a myth. And so, so no, this fold thing about scrolling, this, this is just a myth. I think the first one is, is from Unbounce. So I don't know if Oli got up yet. Uh, so, oh, no, he's not here. So I'm going to kick his ass. So, um, so the, the fold is a myth. You don't have to pay attention to this. And this is when people, this is, could actually be true, but the, the problem with this kind of uh, content and this kind of statements is that people misinterpret them, and they interpret them this way. We were doing our own website, and this was a wireframe that I, we put together. We are saying conversion, create customers out of visitors. How do you want to improve your conversion? And then we have three directional arrows that, that direct them to the three customer segments that we have. So we gave this to the designers and external design agencies. Uh, like, uh, yeah, could you come up with something that, that portrays this? And then they did what uh, Tim Ash, when I listened to him at, at the Conversion Castle, we're going to see some images from the Conversion Castle later on. He said that the problem is that designers use wireframes as a rough point of departure. So they, they think they have the freedom to, yeah, yeah I, I can't see what you're saying, but, but I'm the designer. So they came up with this, conversion, create customers out of visitors. How do you want to improve your conversion? And we're like, yeah, but we're like, where's the call to action? What are you supposed to do? There's, there's actually nothing you can do on this page. Uh, so, and then they said this, we think people know you can scroll these days. That, that was what they said in the meeting. And there, can you spot the errors in this? What, what, what's wrong with this? The first one is we think. Yeah. So they are sitting around thinking about how people uh, are using their website. So what we do, we, go for, we look for the data. And these are some of the data that we got. I try to make like, a, because we have all these analytics accounts. So I try to actually do some big data project on this, but I couldn't finish it in time. So I just grabbed a couple of snapshots. This is one of the biggest e-commerce sites in Sweden. This is their first page. So when you come to the second screen, like only half of the users are there. When you're down on the third screen, there's only 25% left. So what you, you see people slowly dying here. This, this here, this is like the zombie land of walking dead web people. So nothing happens down here. This is our own site. First screen, second screen, roughly. So when, it's really blue down there. So when we work with clients, we see this over and over again. This happens. People, when you come down to the t second, third, fourth screen, not so much happens. So how people scroll is a factor that you need to take into account. So the other error is this. People can scroll, but can and will, those are two different words. And the guy that, that probably nailed it the best is BJ Fogg, a behavioral scientist at Stanford. He has what is called the, the Fogg behavioral model. B equals mad. Uh, a behavior change happens when you have the motivation, the ability, and the trigger. So the ability, you can scroll. You have the ability to scroll, but you don't have the trigger to scroll. That's the problem with saying that people can scroll. So what you can do in order to get people to scroll. Now, this is a screenshot from the starting page of Hotjar, which I will talk a little bit more about this later on in the session. What they are doing on this site, they are breaking this, you know, th this thing that doesn't exist, the fold, they are breaking it here with some images that, sa that says basically, there's more down here, John, because we broke this stuff. So you will un now understand that if you scroll, you will actually see it. And they also have this, not all of you will see this, I, I fold this a little bit. <laughs> so they also have this arrow which points down uh, that indicates that there's more for you down here, John. So. Um, also, when you so so we are this thing that doesn't exist. If it does exist, uh, of course it matters. Then what you put on top and what you put at the bottom. So here's a case study we did for a company called Magin. Now Magin is think of them as Spotify for TV. So you have this you have this app, you have the computer, you have everything, and you can just watch all the TV channels, both live and re recap, uh, in the same device. Uh, they, they ha their big launch market is Germany. So. Uh, we, we did some testing for them there. So we were using the scroll map. I'm not sure what, which of the tools this is, but we were seeing that people, when we, when we got feedback from service and customer service, uh, um, uh, people were saying that they didn't understand how the service was working. Like the benefits, like the content was clear, but how does it actually work? 
So this seemed to be a big hurdle. And they had a section about that, like how it works, which was down here in the green zone, where less than 50% of the visitors were actually watching that. So then we had this hypothesis. If this is a problem for people, why don't we move it to the place where they actually see it? So we did an A-B test where we moved this section from way down, way down and we moved it into the second uh, position on the page. And since this is, doesn't take up the whole page, this fold that doesn't exist uh, will be around here. And then we tested it, and we had something like a 14% uplift in compl and completed signups just by moving that crucial information. We had a call to action in the same place, right? Because there's one of these articles saying where to actually put your call to action. We didn't move the call to action. We just moved the content that supported the action to be taken to that spot. OK, so we have this. There is no fold. Where do you put your calls to action? So the problem is th it's, it's, it's actually the content is right, but the conclusions that people draw from it are wrong. So they, they, say, they say this. Since there is no fold, mo no more, I, lazy designer, do not have to worry about the scroll stuff anymore. So that's the conclusion that they, they draw from this information. But, but this is what the conclusion they should make. We have looked into data to see if users scroll and how our design can make them scroll if that's what we want. That's the conclusion they should be making from this. So, and <coughs> also, People will, when you look at these pages, when you look at the first page, people will act on expected design patterns. What the hell is that, expected design patterns? Well, here's one, the F pattern. You, if you were there when the internet started, you probably remember this. And people will still, to this day, talk about the F pattern when you're sitting down with them and looking at sites. So this is uh, from the Nielsen Norman group who did this, who came up with this idea that people are scanning the page in the form of an F. And of course, when websites look like this, I made this one, it's called Boringo. Welcome to a pointless homepage. Lots and lots of left aligned text over and over again, blah, blah, blah. And then there's, there's a vertical menu here. There's a dia horizontal menu here. And if your page looked like this, then people scan it like this. Like, no shit, Sherlock. It's a, it, I mean, uh, of course that stuff happens. So, um, so now pages look like this. So uh, I took this page from Upstartify. Uh, the most easy to use, uh, yara, sas, yara. And then they have this, some inward-looking boastful copy which no living human life form could be arm, ever arm-twisted into actually reading and then start free trial. So are you familiar with Upstartify? No, I made this shit up. It's just, it doesn't exist. So, and then you need to have like a big keyboard and a coffee mug. They're, they should always be there. And if you can, this should be moving, right? So you can, you can uh, take an image of this. It's, it's a good template for how you want to do this. But if this is what you're getting on the first page, this is the expected design pattern, then this will happen. Because we were arguing about these arrows. Do you remember the arrows I had here? So we were arguing about this, but the designers thought they were ugly and blah, blah, blah. So they, they went. So when... What, what the hell is that? That's from Hotjar installed on our site. People are expecting this start free trials do something so much that they are clicking on it even though it's not there. <laughs> you see this? This is amazing. So one of the good things with, if you're using these kind of click map tools like uh, uh, inspect, let, Hotjar, crazy egg, click tape, whatever, uh, this is the, one of the good things about them, you will see people clicking things that aren't clickable. You will never see this in Google Analytics. Google Analytics only tracks what people click on that can be clicked. But this will actually track people, uh, things that can't be clicked. So, so see how strong this design principle, this design pattern is. Right, so my next blog post is why the fold is a myth is a myth. So, uh, and I would, uh, please, Pep, can I write it on, on your blog someday? Why the fold is a myth is a myth. So. What if the new, the, the, we're still on the first page, getting people to register to your software as a service. The, what if the video shot is the new carousel? You know, the carousels, conversion people hate the carousels. We look at these A-B tests over and over again, which proves that carousels convert not, not as good as static pages. But now we have this new thing. I call it the video hero shot. Uh, is there a better term for it? Uh, it's, it's basically, you have the whole first page and it's moving in the background. Airbnb does said, right? So if they do it, everybody should do it. Like, it, it must be good, right? So what if it's the new carousel? Oh, my god. So let's look at it. So I want to bring some data into this. So this is the test we did with Magin. Uh, this is the starting page from Magin in Germany. And this is it. So you see funny, happy people. You see their faces. There's tons of things going on. There's a Dalmatian walking into the picture. 
So will that make people click on this green thing? What do you think? So we tested it against this one. Uh, this is a, a carousel. So it goes on, it shows a couple of images. Uh, it's, there's another, there's another I, the screenshots are a bit mixed up. So there's variation in the text and the button color and things like that, but that wasn't part of the actual test. So everything was equal except for the, for the carousel and so on. And then one of the, we picked one of these images, uh, one of the static images and kept it. So we had the video, we had a carousel, and we had a static image. Now this is what happened. So uh, the engagement went up for the slider and the video. So people were staying on the page more. They were clicking more on the page. And I don't know actually what goes behind that. My idea is that it's like, this shit is so annoying. I have to click anything to get out of here or something like that. So, but then when we look at final, uh, that like the, the objective of this test was to test how people clicked on the button. And what you can see here is that 30% people, 30 percent less people clicked on the button when we had the video moving in the background. So here's my idea about the video hero shot. It distracts people from the conversion goal. It messes up readability because the contrast is changing all the time. So it's really hard to read a text. And also, what you can see in eye tracking studies, if you've done eye tracking studies, is that people will scan images and possibly read text. If you put text on the image, they perceive it as a part of the image, which means that it's not read worthy. So they just scan it. So text on image becomes image becomes not read. So these are the three problems with a, with a video hero shot. I would love to see more tests on it. We have only done one test on it, but it was pretty conclusive. So step two, now we're beyond the first page. We got people in, and then it becomes the problem of getting them to use the damn thing. And this, my friends, is the biggest problem of them all. Why do I have this image? If you Google the biggest problem of them all, that's what you get. So. Um, the getting to people to use your product is re or service is really, really difficult. So you can do this. You can just uh, sit on your ass and watch the lunch fly by. You, you get your regis they register to your product, and you sit there. And you sit there for 29 days. And for day 30, you're like, hey, I'm John from blah, 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 blah. Would you like to use my service? And people go like, what, what are you talking about? I signed up for 30 different competitors. And like, you are who? I never used your product. So getting people to use the service is the most, the most crucial thing you can do if you have this kind of software as a service or a similar subscription service or something like that. So we got a new user. And this is what typically happens when we go out to, uh, to, out to clients. It's like, how are you treating your signups, your, your new users? Oh, yeah, we hit them in the head with the newsletter. That's, that's basically what we do. And the newsletter, it looks like this. this I, is Chris here? Uh, no, he's, oh, I'm going to kick his ass too. So, First, you have a, a pre-header. It goes like this. April's newsletter from couldnotcareless.com. Click here to view this newsletter on the web. So unsubscribe here. News bar. So they, they take up the pre-header. You consume all this uh, real estate for useless administrative information, so you actually don't know what it's about. So, but then if you actually open it, they will say, we are proud to announce the Cloud App 2.1 or something. And they're going to Chicago. You can meet them there. And they have some Bapel and Moogle and Cake book just became customers and, and, and blah, blah, blah. So this is, this is stuff that happens. This is talking about them. This is not talking about me, how I use the product, anything like that. So if you climb up the ladder, first, you just sit on the frog's ass. That's the first thing you can do. The second thing is you can hit them with the newsletter. That's what a, what a lot of people do. But then, basically, you do what's called an activation series of email. That's, that's the standard thing to do. It's really basic. It, some of you might be saying, John, that's yesterday's news. Why are you talking about that? Well, in this blog post I'm going to uh, talk about later by Neil Patel, it shows that only 26% of SaaS companies actually do this in the US. So what is that? Let's look at Hotjar. Uh, in order to have data, to have uh, insights that I could uh, relay on stage here, uh, I've, made, I, uh, I've been impressed by Hotjar. They started in June. Uh, a year ago, they started their beta in September. It ended in April. They have 32,620 users as, two as of two days ago when I asked David, and 50% of them are active, and they have 200 signups per day. So my idea is that these guys are doing something right. Let's find out what. So I made an interview with David, the founder, in order to get material for this talk. And one of the things he sent me is this short summary of the Hotjar beta. So they are, when you see this, you understand that they are obsessed with numbers. 
the beta in numbers. These are how many people that actually came in. And this is what they did. So they keep good track of what people are doing. What parts of the product are people using? So that's an important metric for them. They're also looking at the feedback they are getting from the users. So they recorded 6,000 conversations with the Hotjar team, which led to 681 logged feature suggestions, and not only getting input, but actually working on it. So here's how they tracked what they shipped. 69 of those requested feature actually made it into production during the beta. So when you see this kind of, he sent this PDF over to me, when you see this, it's, the numbers aren't that important. It's the fact that they are obsessing about those numbers and, and that they are including their, their customers, their users into their story. It's, it's a really important sign, I think, of why they were successful. Um, and they've been, they've been masters at using their own tools David said that I don't believe in quantitative data. I believe in qualitative data. So they are constantly using their polls and surveys and exit things to get more and more and more and more feedback from their users. And I think that's been part of the success they've been doing. If you look at this, is what you see when you log into the Hotjar account. You see it says last 24 hour activity, recent user activity. So just by the fact when you log in, they are they are telling you this is activity. These are important things. So just by logging in, it's focused on activity. So you want to activate users, of course. Then the login first page is focused on activity, of course. Uh, they also included already here the viral loop. So you can immediately here give a tip to other users. And uh, they're also doing this, which I think is amazing. They, they say, follow us on Twitter inside their service. Have you seen another SaaS company that, that incentivizes people to follow them on Twitter? Not in their emails or on their... Facebook page or something like that, but actually in the product. I think that's really nice. And also down here, which you people don't see, uh, David here, he says this. He says, hi, John, we need your help. We're just starting to look into a lot. So they have in-product, in-service messaging, and they're not, uh, th that's another touch point for them to get more feedback. And they're also using this little red thing. What does that mean? It's, 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 it's not like... Uh, Hello, our product team has made an, an announcement. This is David. This is a person. And the red little thing says, like, you know, that's, this connotates as with everything we have on our phones. Like, this is shit you need to take action on. You don't want that one. You want a zero there. So you need to click that thing to, to make the one go away, right? Um, here's a survey. After you complete the trial, you take our survey. If you don't know what to do, how to activate users, activate them with anything, like a survey, something, just something that puts you, when they are, com when they are comparing you with 10 other uh, similar services, do something that puts you top of mind, that puts you back at, at the top of the stack of things they are looking at. So we're now working with the activation series of email. What, what is the next step after that? That's what I call targeted activation series. What the hell is that? Well, it basically says that when you have this flow here, you, there's something when they're a registered prospect will make them become an active user. When they're an active user, something will get them to pay. And when they're paying, something will get them to stay. So what are those things? What are the things that drive the progression from one step to another? Well, what David told me when, when we were talking, he said when they analyzed how people were using the product, they found out nine things which if people had started to use one of those nine things, that turned them into an active user. So they were looking, at, they were looking back. Here's an active user. What did that user, active user do before that made them be become active? They found out nine things. And so they now devised a series. If this is from my inbox. You can see step eight, step seven, step six. So they basically have an email series which are targeted to those specific things of the product that actually drives activity. Now, this is... Uh, also known as the aha moment. Uh, and I don't know, if this is a growth hackers talk about this all the time. I, are you familiar with this aha moment uh, terminology, so to speak? Have you heard about it? Some people not. So the, um, you can find out if you check the growth hackers blog or something like that, you, you will find information about this. Basically, Twitter, they found out that if you follow 30 people, you are likely to become a, an active Twitter user. Dropbox, they found out that if you uh, upload at least one file, you will become a Dropbox user. Zynga found out if you're coming back the day after the download, you're most, more likely to stay. Facebook, they have this target, seven friends within 10 days. So these are the, they call them the aha moments, or this guy, you can check this out. It's on Richard Price's blog. It's called Growth Hacking, Leading Indicators of Engaged Users. So these, uh, for example, 
Twitter, in the beginning, they thought that the most important thing was to do a tweet. But when they looked at their data, they saw, no, it's the, the follow 30 people is a better predictor for staying uh, as an active Twitter user than doing your first tweet. So they are not trying to get people to follow 30 people because that will make them stay. So you need to find your aha moment. And, and David, he find nine of those aha moments. He have still, they're still looking into the data. They're only a year old. So he's now trying to find out what is it that predicts actual final conversion to paying. He, he now knows how to predict activity, but he doesn't know yet how to predict at retention. Uh, they've been in business too short for that, but they're working on that. Maybe I can come back next year and talk about that. <laughs> so I thought I was done with this, uh, preparing my speech. As I went to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, I got an email from this guy called Lincoln Murphy, who's a consultant to SaaS companies in the US. He's one of the big shots in this. And I got this email at 2 o'clock in the morning, three secrets of high converting SaaS free trials. And I think, oh, shit, there might be something interesting in this, which I need for my talk. So I started to dig into that at 2 o'clock this morning. And one of the things that he said there in a related article, which I found, it says autoresponders are dead, at least in SaaS. So I'm, I'm talking about this activation series of email. They're autoresponders. And this guy, he's like a guru. I'm just a, I'm just a guy that I'm on stage and I do funny talks. So, so he's saying autoresponders are dead. And I'm just, I w that's what I was talking about. And I'm like, shit, you know, Lincoln Murphy is putting me down. So, so basically, wh but what, what is it that he means? He says that it needs to be triggered. It's not, it not just a, a one size fits all series of email, but it needs to find the triggers in the behavior so that you send the right email to the right person. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, we do that. So yeah, I'm cool. So I'm going to show you one example of how we work with, Mic with, with Imagine for that. Uh, we use Mixpanel. How many of you use Mixpanel? Are you familiar? Yeah. So you know that you can send, you can send uh, events from apps with Mixpanel. So when people are using the, Mix, the Imagine TV app, we trigger an event. So for example, with Germany, Germany has a, a large population of Turkish people, uh, ex expats from Turkey. So we are looking at the events, and we have this rule. If they watch more than 10 minutes of Turkish channels, we shift them to the Turkish experience, the Turkish newsletters, the Turkish in-app messaging, the Turkish everything. So that's one of the things. You're looking at the behavior in your product, in your service, and depending on what happened there, you put them on another train. You can see what you're basically doing is your whole trial, your whole experience up to getting them to pay, is like you're at a train station. There are different trains departing, and you need to pack every train as much as you can. So these people thought they were going to Germany, but we put them on the Turkey train instead. So you got active users now. Let's see if we can get paid. That's, that's the tricky part. And basically, the biggest question, uh, the biggest question about, um, about getting paid with, uh, is should I ask for the credit card in the beginning or at the end? What's the answer to this question? Well, the, I became very inspired by this uh, blog post by Neil Patel, how to market to customers when the free trial is over. So here's a study they did with 100 SaaS companies in the US. You find it on the Kiss Metrics blog. This is not my stuff, this is Neil's or whoever wrote it for him. So they compared credit card required and credit card not required. So the visit to free trial uh, sign up conversion was 2% with credit card, 10% without the credit card. So more people got on. But then when you look at the next step, the conversion rate is 50% when you, when you require the credit card. So more people stay in that phase, but only 15 here. That's natural. You had more freeloaders here, so more of them drop off here. And then these numbers are kind of, of similar. But what really is important here, the end-to-end -end conversion was twice as high when you didn't require the credit card as when you require the credit card. And this is natural because your biggest problem is to get people to use your product, right? So you don't want to put, put as, you want to put as little as possible between the user and the trial and you actually using the product. And one of those things that you don't want to put there is the credit card. Uh, that you want to put the credit card if your business is tricking people into your service and getting them to stay an extra month and then becoming pissed and leaving. You know? So if that's your business, you should require the credit card. If that's not your business, don't do it. Um, there's also this. I tried to find this post on Kissmetrics. I couldn't find it. There was a case study when they were looking at the call to action on the first page. 
uh, of a SaaS service, and they used the word free in, in the start trial, start free trial, something like this, and they had a 20% uplift in conversion. But when they looked later on how many people that actually stayed and paid, there wasn't any difference. So basically, what, when you are A-B testing as, as this kind of business, what you're doing when you're testing on the first page, should we require a credit card or not, what you're basically doing is like you have a funnel, you have a drop-off, and you are basically shifting where the drop-off happens. So it, it, what we did here, we got more people to register. That's good. But what really matters is that how many of those people actually make it to the end here. That's the important thing. Uh, so then you need to do something called cohort analysis, which is like, oh, no, shit, this is uh, only, you know, 1030, and, and this really difficult terminology is like, John, please don't do that. Well, the cohort analysis is this. Uh, here's your train station. Uh, this is now available in Google Analytics also. This is from Mixpanel. A cohort analysis that out of the people that came in on this day, what is their activity uh, from, this is from Magin. So you can see how they are gradually kind of dying. So the people that came in here, they're not as active. So what, what, what happened between these dates? And you can also segment the data differently. So you can see, you can have, these are like uh, Firefox users, and these are Chrome users. So you can segment it differently to see how they behave over time. This is a cohort analysis. So when you're optimizing, you are pretty soon going to get away from just testing buttons on the first page. But actually, watching, if we do this, what happens with the customer during 30 days, or the user during 30 days? And then, at, you're also going to, at the end of it, you're going to work with something called predictive analytics. And like, oh, that's even harder. And it's only now 10.35, and you're hitting me in the head with this. So uh, if you want to talk predictive analytics, you should go talk to Ton. He's a, he knows his shit. I'm just talking about it. So, but predictive analytics is this. We have a customer in Sweden called Motem, uh, and they sell food online. So they're working with a statistics company, which is more into this than we, than we are. And they're doing a project now. Uh, and the goal of this project, and they're pretty close to it, they are going to predict with 90% accuracy which of the people that come into the service are going to become uh, high-value customers. Uh, and basically, on the first purchase. Not by following them over time, but by basically looking at the behavior on their first touch point with the service. They think they will be able, with 90% accuracy, to determine whether they become a high-value customer or not. So this is the stuff you're going to be working with in the future. So finally, two case studies from, from Spotify uh, regarding payment. So if you, wanna, if you really need to get the money beforehand, here's a good idea. Tell people why you need their money. So this was, this was how it looked. This was a test we did on the US market for the premium product for Spotify. So you can select the payment method. And we made an exit survey. And people said this. I don't want to leave my credit card details for something that is free. So they didn't understand why they had to give their credit card for something which was free. What the hell is up with that, you know? So we gave them three alternatives. We only use this to verify your account. We put it in a little blue box here. We need this because our music deals only allow free tiles if you do this. We need this just in case you decide to stay premium after one th free month. So this is the results we got from this. And also, you need to look at the whole funnel. Because the click-through rate to the payment gateway actually went down. It was the same or went down with this one. But then when we looked at the final conversion, we had an uplift for we only use this to verify and blame the record company. So these two came out as winning, winning variations uh, for Spotify. This, we can't say how much it was. It was a single-digit uplift in the US market. But that's, that's serious money for Spotify. And then the last step, uh, when people are about to leave your service, Oh, that's, uh, they're churning. Oh. So what can you do now? So here's another case we did with Spotify. What they were doing, they were doing this. Uh, when people said unsubscribe, this is the page they came to. So just the wording they are using there, it says your subscription, why are you unsubscribing? By using the word unsubscribing, you are now positively confirming they, they were thinking about unsubscribing, and now you're confirming. Yes, you are about to unsubscribe. It's like, so that's the first step. You're confirming what they want to do here. So this is what we did instead with them. We said, about your subscription, can we help? So, and then we gave them six different options. And the first one of these are switch to free. And so then we, had, we were addressing these objections. Did you know that every week, the average premium user skips every second song? Like, are you really sure you want to get out of that? 
Or if they said, I'm trying to save money, well, maybe you should uh, cut down on your coffee or on your pizzas and stay with Spotify Premium. So we had six different paths, depending on the reason that people gave to, to stay, to leave Spotify. And then the final push is, uh, in, in line with the DNA of Spotify, we had a playlist here, which is called I Want You Back with the Jackson 5. So, and people actually clicked that, which took them out of the cancellation loop. So here you can see, we, this was an A-B test where we wanted the, the variations to lose because we wanted fewer people to complete the conversion. And you can see that at, at the uh, final step of this, we had, a, we had a negative then positive result. Again, I can't tell you how much exactly is, this was a digital, it was a double digit uh, improvement for, for Spotify. So, in summary, if I look at what Hotjar did here, uh, I go back to Hotjar. Look, let's look at how they, this was the, I got this from Wayback Machine. So, uh, this was like six months ago. They had this big thing here, the, this arrow pointing down and this like scroll down to find here. They removed that. I didn't talk to David about this. I just backtracked it. And now they had two buttons a couple of months ago, and now this is what they are using. So. They're saying, this is what you're getting above the fold. They're saying, you can sign up now. It is free. You don't require the credit card. You're breaking the fold here. They're telling you to scroll down. And they got this sticky header so you can sign up on whatever page you are. So basically, the things that I talked about during the talk, they all incorporated on this uh, particular page. I haven't talked. I, I tried to get David's feedback on what the results were of this. But uh, he was, uh, I didn't get him. He's busy. In summary, what I've been talking about is basically illustrated by this graph. Uh, the kind of testing you're doing is about moving your bottlenecks in your funnel. Where is your biggest bottleneck and how can you move the shift of traffic? And you need to keep an eye on what happens in the end. And activation is probably your biggest problem, that you don't get enough users to actively use your product, which means that they have invested it in it so that they will be more likely to convert. And you should not ask for the credit card. This is what you should do when you leave the conference. Then in the future, you will want to work with cohort analysis, and you want to work with predictive analytics. If you want to go to another conference on this theme, there's a thing called Conversion Jam in Stockholm on September 1st, which I host. Uh, and basically, we got three awesome speakers. They are Pep Laja, uh, Ole Gardner, and Andre Morris. So you should come and see. No, not really, right? Uh, yeah, but we got other one. We got Neil Patel from Crazy Egg and Kids Metrics. We got Sophia Quintero, who's the head of growth at Gecko Board, who was the head of growth at Gecko Board. We got Sandy Hathaway from Avari, who's going to talk about machine learning, man versus machine optimization. It's on. It's in Stockholm on September 1st. Uh, uh, these guys are going to be amazing as well, but you've already seen them. So I want to say in Swedish, Tak. Uh, this is my team. Uh, you reach me here at Conversionista or John at Conversionista. And uh, as I say, always be converting. Thank you very much. All right, we only have time for a few questions. Um, first one, do people scroll more or less on mobile phones compared to desktop? They scroll more. What's your opinion? <laughs> What's your that, that's the data we have. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, it's less. Yeah. Okay. But opinions don't matter. Yeah. Um, next, uh, which software do you use for eye tracking? Uh, we use Toby. Toby. Yeah. Oh, you're quick. Uh, why didn't Imagine or Imagine TV roll out the winning variation of the explanation of the service high oh, up I on the page? Oh, I knew I'd get this. <laughs> you have people in a business which are obsessed with optimizing and, and uh, you know, turning every stone and... and and, and look at it uh, and see how they can optimize. And then you have the branding people. Uh, and sometimes the branding people and the marketing people, they kick the ass of the optimization people, which they did in this particular case. And last question, uh, what if there is no clear data pattern to discover the aha moment? That's a good question. Look harder. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you.